Good morning. From Matthew chapter 24, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, false prophets will appear and deceive many people. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. About 2,000 years ago, a baby boy was born in the Middle East. His birth has changed the face of the planet and have changed all our lives ever since. Almost 600 years later, another baby boy was born in the Middle East. His birth has also changed the face of the planet and affected all of our lives ever since. The first baby, as you know, was born in a Jewish town or large village called Bethlehem. This second baby was born about 1,500 kilometres to the southeast in an Arabian city called Mecca in A.D. 570. His mother, Amina, gave birth to him a few months after his father, Abdullah, had died on a trading trip. So he he thus grew up without a father. When news of the birth was brought to his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, he took the child in his arms, gave thanks to God, I guess... Reminders, really, of what Simeon did hundreds of years earlier with the baby Jesus. But this man took this child in his hands, gave thanks to God, and called the baby the praised one, which in Arabic is Muhammad. The boy's family belonged to the powerful Quraysh tribe, and his father was a a leading citizen of that tribe. And Quraysh mothers would usually give their children to a nurse in a Bedouin tribe so that the child could breathe in the healthy desert air. They felt this was a good start to life. So Muhammad was nursed for two years by Halima, who then brought the child back to his mother, Amina, after this two-year period of breathing in the uh, wholesome desert air. She, however, declared that she did not want him to breathe the unwholesome air of Mecca, and so back he went again to the desert. Two years later, the nurse again appeared, but this time she was troubled. The child had had numerous fits, which made her think that he might be demon-possessed. She didn't take him, she did take him back, but after many subsequent epileptic fits, she returned him to her mother when he was five years old. Muhammad always gratefully remembered the care that Halima, uh, his nurse, had given him. Well, his mother, Amina, I get confused here, mother Amina, nurse Halima, his mother Amina died when he was six. Uh, And so his grandfather then took care of him. However, his grandfather died only two years later, aged 80. So he had a somewhat disturbed upbringing through the deaths of most of the people who were closest to him. So he was then given, at this tender age, to his paternal uncle, Abu Talib, who raised him. And Muslims often stress that he was an orphan, and some even claim that he raised himself up by his own efforts, but that's not exactly true. Well, from the age of 12, he was often taken on merchant trips to Damascus by his uncle. And at the age of 25, he entered the service of a rich widow called Khadija, whom he married. 
Now, although she was 40 and herself had been married twice before, she bore him two sons and four daughters. Sadly, both sons died in infancy and three of the four daughters died in childhood. And during the 25 years he was married to her, he took no other wife. He was later to have many wives. Aisha, said to be his 11th wife, used to say that he loved three things, women, perfumes and food. Well, at the age of about 40, he began to retire frequently to a cave on the slopes of Mount Hira. That's about three miles or five kilometres from Mecca. He He went there for meditation. And it was said he was greatly disturbed initially by messages he received, not knowing if it was from God or from the devil. Uh, Mohammed didn't actually receive another message until some time had elapsed. But after that, they were then sent down regularly, uh, apparently through the angel Gabriel, as what Muslims believe. Some seem to think he went into a trance and he himself was afraid of, of, of what was happening to him. Anyway, these messages that he claimed to have received from Gabriel, he recited to a growing number of followers who were initially just the members of his own family. There was Khadija, his wife. There was Ali, who was a cousin and an adopted son. Abu Bakr, who was a wealthy merchant, he wasn't a family member, uh, he also was included in this sort of inner circle and he became a very important figure, uh, as you'll hear later, in the early history of Islam. He then joined that group as well. In fact, he was to become the successor to Muhammad and was really the one who was attributed with consolidating Islam and giving it a firm uh, foundation. So here we have this little emerging group with their own ideas and thoughts in the city of Mecca, uh, and this led to growing hostility from the rest of the people who lived there. In fact, there was persecution began on this little uh, nucleus of people from the leaders of the city, which finally resulted in Mohammed and this group having to leave and to seek asylum elsewhere. Um, They finally settled at a place called Yathrib, which today is known as Medina. It's about 250 miles or 400 kilometres to the north Uh, of Mecca, and he found there that the people were actually favourably disposed towards him and also to his teaching. The thinking behind that is possibly the fact that uh, there was a a, a local Jewish community and uh, it was known that Jews were looking for a Messiah and possibly the fact that he arrived with these um, ideas and thoughts Uh, made the people uh, more disposed towards him as maybe he was the fulfilment of this idea of a messiah. Whatever. He settled there. He built the great mosque. uh, And then after some time, uh, he, he continued these ideas that he had been receiving. This emigration from Mecca to Medina took place in 622 AD and is generally, that's the date that people... Uh, say that Islam began. That's the foundation date when they arrived at the end of this uh, move from the one city to the other. What's incredible is that in the following eight years, Muhammad and his followers succeeded in bringing the whole Arabian Peninsula under their control. And if you have a look at the map, that is no small area. The citizens of that particular part of the world were long weary of internal strife And they welcomed a leader who could unite them. It it, it proved to be really the early formation there of a power base for Islam. In reality, what it was doing was, it was bringing together a a group of of different uh, tribes um, who all had had their own struggles and fights, mainly with each other, and it gave them a common identity. So instead of fighting each other, Uh, and quarrelling amongst themselves. Together, united, they had uh, a common identity, they had a common leader, and they very much had a common goal as well. It's interesting to note that in the early days, even Jews and Christians were sympathetic 
to the teaching of Muhammad because he taught on the unity of God and also he condemned uh, very strongly any idolatry. And it was here that many of the now familiar doctrines of Islam began to take shape. For instance, in uh, 624 AD, uh, there was a famous battle, the Battle of Badr, and that gave victory to Muhammad's forces. The importance of that battle not lay in the, the fact of the battle, but rather that from that time onwards, sanction was given towards what was called a holy war. In other words, when um, Islam was under threat, it was now permissible, in fact it was now welcomed, to actually uh, go on a holy war against those who were seeking to oppose or attack Islam. The word given for that is jihad, and so jihad became part of the vocabulary and part, I guess, of the doctrine and theology of, of early Islam. Well, Muhammad died in 632 AD at the age of 62. Uh, and that same year he delivered his last message from Allah, as he uh, would express it. Here is a few sentences from that last speech. He said, Today I have completed my religion for you and I have fulfilled the extent of my favour towards you. It is my will that Islam be your religion. I have completed my mission. I have left you the book of Allah and clear commandments. If you keep them, you will never go wrong. Well, Caliph Abu Bakr, Caliph just is the word that was coined, I think, for, for the leader, proved a victorious leader for Islam. Within only two years, Syria, Iraq, Persia and Egypt fell in quick succession. By 656, under Caliph Uthman, the Islamic borders stretched to Afghanistan and to the east, to Libya in the west and the Caucasus Mountains in the north. That's a very short time from this little nucleus spreading their influence dramatically and far and wide throughout the earth. The conquest of the remainder of North Africa and the advance through Spain in, into France was only halted in 732 AD. That's exactly 100 years since Muhammad died. At one of history's famous crucial battles, it was fought between Tours and Poitiers, which is in the south of France, and under the French general Charles Martel, uh, they were able to defeat, and it was a significant victory, they were able to defeat the oncoming Islamic insurgents and really turn them away from there. Had Charles Martel and the French army been defeated, today it may well be that the whole of France, and in fact the whole of the United Kingdom, might well be Islamic countries. Uh, Nish, the... Uh, atheistic philosopher rather sarcastically said this, he said the greatest mistake in world history was the defeat of the Arabs at Tours and Poitiers hmm. well with the exception of the Christian Coptics in Egypt the Christian church in North Africa was completely overthrown and to this day the Coptic church survives in quite large numbers in Egypt and there is thinking in mission circles that in some ways if this rather ritualistic and formal church could get its act together they could be very much a key in the Middle East for the Gospel. The church that was defeated and overthrown in North Africa had numbered amongst it some outstanding leaders. Names that most of you will be aware of Augustine, Tertullian, Cyprian and Anathasius, Athanasius and the church found itself through disobedience and division quite unable to resist the oncoming advancing forces of Islam well some very serious lessons for us from this whole episode which is why I'm spending really this session just teaching something of the history of Islam for instance the Bible says that uh, it was in Antioch where you could first hear the believers being called Christians. Well, today, if you visit that city, which is 
now in modern Turkey, you will only hear the call to prayer five times a day. It's very unlikely you'll hear anybody talking about Christianity or Christians. So all this raises two very important questions. First question is this, how was it that a Islam could advance so rapidly in its early days. And the other side, the second question is this, how was it that the church and really Christian civilization collapsed so rapidly, so almost completely? Well, our first question, how was it that Islam advanced so rapidly? I've already hinted as to part of the reason for that. Muslims were and are dedicated to carrying out the will of God, the will of Allah, as they see it. They have a monotheistic message. In other words, just one God. There is no good God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of God. And this is repeated uh, uh, time and time again. And there's a total commitment to this cause where death in the defence of Islam or death in the propagation, the, the, the spreading of Islam is seen as a bonus. And Islam itself is a whole society system. Please don't just think in terms of religious beliefs. It's far bigger than that. It affects every single area of life. It affects everything. You name it. If you're a Muslim, then Islam affects it. Food. What you eat, what you don't eat. How you prepare your food, uh, and when you eat certain types of food and when you don't. Dress, how you dress, how a man dresses, how a woman dresses. Law, the law of the land, the law that, that governs, the Sharia law, the, the basic fundamental Islamic law that, that rules the whole of life. Education, what you teach your children, what you don't teach your children, how teaching process is done. Family structure the role of the husband and wife, the headship of the husband over everything, how the children are treated in the home, how women act in the home. Politics, how a country is ruled, an Islamic country, uh, how, how the, the rulers oversee the affairs of the nation. Money, how money is treated, how the banking system works, how much money you have, how you give money to the poor people. You see, it's total. So anybody coming out from a Muslim background, from a, uh, what might call a fundamentalist in terms of those who, who, who believe the Quran and practice it, someone who comes from that background to Christianity, it's a huge step. It's not just changing your religion. You're, you're leaving behind a society, a family. So that was one reason why it advanced so rapidly, that the totality of Islam in terms of the message that it had it also, as I said before, united warring tribes. Those who had been fighting each other were now banded together. They had a, a common vision, a common purpose, a common mission. And it is a missionary religion, very much so. Probably, in many ways, perhaps the only other big missionary religion other than Christianity is Islam. They want to conquer the world. And so now these, these tribes that fought each other, with enthusiasm together, work towards a common goal. And, following on from that, here was an opportunity to extend their civilization worldwide. Remember, it started with just a group of desert tribes living in the sand with their camels. They were going to move from the desert to the land and they were going to cross the seas in the process. And as I said, it's, it's incredible how quickly countries, civilization, capitulated, fell before the advance of Islam in 638. Just what, six years after the death of Muhammad, Jerusalem fell. 640, Caesarea, Palestine and Syria fell. 642, first of all Alexandria, then all of Egypt. That's just ten years after the death of Muhammad. 650, the whole ancient empire of Persia was destroyed. 697, Carthage. 715, most of Spain. And then, as I said, 100 years from the death of Muhammad, we have this first check, if you like, in their advance in this famous battle uh, uh, that Charles Martel had the victory at. So that was the answer to the first question. How was it that Islam advanced so rapidly? The other question, with its sad, sorry answers, 
is, how was it that the church, and not just the church, I think Christian civilization collapsed in front of the advance of Islam. Why was resistance so feeble? Well, there's a whole catalogue of reasons and it, it boils down to serious uh, problems within the church itself. First problem, and these aren't in any order of priority, but list I have here. First problem is this. The church was very much absorbed with discussing doctrine over the person of Christ. What I mean by that was there were some opposing views as to the nature of Christ. Did he have one nature or did he have two natures? It's actually a very important matter, but this was taking up an awful lot of time, a lot of discussion, and so the church was, was looking inward rather than looking outward. If I sort of summarise it, uh, one writer I was looking at described it like this. It's the difference between comparing um, water and wine and oil and water. Bear with me. Water and wine, you've got two substances that if you mix them together are totally mixed. You can't then really separate them out. They become one, one substance. You can't identify the separate parts. And one group on one extreme were saying it's impossible to distinguish between the, the, uh, the deity and the humanity of Christ. It, it totally, uh, you're incapable of separating out. It's, it's just one indistinguishable uh, uh, part of his nature. On the other side, you have the oil and water people who say, no, two very separate natures. Sometimes he acted in his humanity where his divinity was not present. Other times he acted in his divinity where his humanity was not present. You know, it might seem we're arguing about words, uh, and yet these are important matters. But it had come to such a state with, with strong camps on each side that there were councils arising, uh, or one groups that were calling themselves the Nestorians and the Monophysites, all these fancy names if you, if you study uh, these things. But it, it was a matter that, that detracted the church from its mission. That's the first thing. Secondly, the church itself had lost, it had lost it. It had lost that early zeal of the early church. The days of persecution were now long since gone and so the church was becoming divided, denominations were appearing, nominalism was a huge problem, people who were Christian by name only, not really confessing or living for Christ. It became very concerned with money and buildings. Buildings hadn't been a, a, a consideration, they went from house to house. Or they rented a hall, but now having a building, having a big building, having an ornate building, of course all the money that that consumed on buildings, Again, it was all subtly diverting the attention of the Christians from their main focus and goal. There was a hierarchy appearing in the church. Um, different, different ranks you could attain to. A sort of clergy and laity division, but, but, but many things in between those two. Christian services have become very ritualistic in many places, very ceremonial, very formal, very predictable, very boring. And politics, as ever, had got into the church. And so a lot of time was spent discussing various matters of leadership and, uh, and other things. So all these things together aided the advance of Islam and prevented any real attempt to halt it. Added to this problem was the fact that you remember that the Roman Empire had become Christian when Constantine the uh, emperor had, had said he'd become Christian. There's plenty of arguments about whether he really did become a Christian or not. I've even discovered a website dedicated to arguing about whether or not Constantine was a Christian. Uh, if you want to find that out and spend a few happy hours discussing with people across the planet uh, whether or not he was truly saved, uh, you're welcome to do that. But nonetheless, it was a problem. You see, because being he became a Christian, so... The Roman Empire became Christian, so everybody in the Roman Empire was Christian. And when the Roman Empire tried to extend its borders, because it was always attacking, especially the barbarians, uh, and conquering them, the conquered peoples became firstly part of the Roman Empire, and secondly, automatically, Christian. Which, of course, 
They may deeply resent it. They resented being conquered and they certainly resented the imposition of a foreign religion that they had to adhere to. And so this, you had this huge number of people saying, well, yeah, I'm Christian because I'm part of the Roman Empire, but actually no real understanding of the gospel and certainly no true salvation experience. Added to that, the Roman Empire had become increasingly corrupt, a corrupt administration, taxation was very heavy, and the thought was, well, maybe under Islam, life is going to be a bit easier. We aren't going to have this heavy taxation. Uh, and then, conversion traffic, if I can use that phrase, was all one way. It was all, almost without exception, from Christianity to Islam. There were very few exceptions. Partly because, of course, the Muslims said, yes, there is religious freedom. Meaning what? There is religious freedom for Christians to become Muslims, but for Muslims to convert uh, to Christianity well, that's considered apostasy and uh, could be met with, uh, with the death penalty. So, religious freedom, but only from one direction. So, when Islam arrived and started moving forwards, then, I say, there was virtually no resistance. Um, there was a small loss of life. Actually, there wasn't a huge loss of life, not, I think, as much as some people have represented. Muslims were not so concerned with killing Christians. They actually wanted the land, they were expanding their territory and they needed those who were in that territory to act as their, well, everything really. I mean, these were, these were Arab desert people of the, of the sand. They knew very little about administration, about farming. They, they weren't farmers. They needed the, the farmers who were there, the peasants to cultivate the land. They needed translation, translators, they needed government clerks. So the aim was, get the land, sort of semi-enslave the people and use them uh, to help the society to move forwards. Well, what happened to those who remained Christians? Well, a number, well, many, many Christians lived on as Christians, but were forever second-class citizens. They had no equality, they had no privileges, they had very few rights. Some Christians did manage to rise quite high in the government, but uh, there was always this, this pressure, ceaseless pressure, to convert to Islam, uh, which sadly many of them eventually did, because of the promise, I guess, of more money and, uh, and more uh, authority. So the result of all this was that no longer did all roads lead to Rome. Islam now controlled the mainland and the sea routes. And of course, the later discovery of oil in this region was going to be very significant. Christianity receded. It had been a, virtually a world religion at that stage. It became mainly a sort of European religion. Well, if you think things were bad at that stage, uh, they were about to become even worse. And uh, we now come to a, a passage in the history of the church, uh, which is desperately sad um, and yet is something that you need to look at and we need to learn from. What am I talking about? Well, yes, the idea was born mainly amongst the popes that they needed to go out as a Christian army and reclaim these holy places such as Jerusalem that the Muslims had captured. They needed to go out and take from the hands of these infidels, these unbelievers, take back the land and take back some of the, the holy sites. You see, already holy sites had started to develop. So it was also a, there was another agenda the popes had. The knights had been behaving a bit like the, uh, the Arab uh, desert tribes. They were constantly fighting each other. The knights were all in different classes and these different knightly classes were constantly battling. Here was a chance for the knight classes unitedly to go out and conquer uh, and use their fighting energies in a different direction. And so began uh, what is known as the Crusades. The aim was to expand the Christian territory, recapture these holy cities and, and uh, sacred places not to convert the Muslims. What a shame. 
what a shame if this whole enterprise hadn't had a different basis, a different impetus, a different plan behind it. There was no thought of converting, uh, of converting uh, the Muslims. It was to recapture the land. And the Crusades had been romanticised in legends. One of the last things I did before I came here was to go and watch the film The Kingdom of Heaven. I don't know if anybody has seen it here. This is Hollywood's take on the Crusades. Of course, they've had to be very careful. You've got to be politically correct. You don't want to upset the Muslims. You don't want to too downgrade the Christians. So it treads a rather uneven middle path. Nonetheless, it's worth seeing. I'll give you some idea of what happened. And there again, there's some good websites that provide some good material for further discussion. So, Crusades, five of them, <coughs> lasted 200 years. Tens of thousands of people died. Uh, the Crusaders, as they were called, went out with crosses on their shields. By this sign we conquer. And from a military point of view, uh, historians say the earlier of the five Crusades was, was more successful. But actually, in the end, all the gains were lost. I would say it was worse than that. Not were all gains lost. This did irreparable damage to the church of Jesus Christ uh, in one particular sense. <clears throat> it was a disaster for the Christian cause. Here was a real potential opportunity to dialogue between Christians and Muslims. It was lost. It wasn't just lost. It was worse than that. It caused damage that is still felt today. What were the results, the tragic results of the Crusades? And um, I'm not going to talk about the Crusades. You can go away and read all about, you know, these different characters uh, who did you know, great deeds, as it were. But the results, first of all, it damaged relationships actually between the East and the West branches of Christianity. Because the Fourth Crusade, in its, its blindness and stupidity, actually sacked Constantinople, where the eastern part of the church was, uh, which was, which was, was terrible and, and still today perpetuates divisions between some of the, uh, the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church and, and the church in the West. Secondly, and perhaps most significantly, it severely and damaged Christian Muslim relations. Muslims see these events as happening, as far as they're concerned, yesterday. You say, well, wait a minute, this is 800 years ago. Yeah, but you scratch, and just below the surface, the Muslims, those enlightened ones, those who know something about their history, will say, well, you know, what, what, you know gospel of love. What about the Crusades, where thousands died, as you came with the cross to conquer and to destroy let me just say this, uh, as I'm going through this. I'm talking about Islam, and next week I'll go into the doctrines and the beliefs and the practices of it. But the sort of Islam I'm talking about is that which would, would be hardly known by the people we're, who, who are around here. The people outside here, you know more about Islam than the vast majority of the, the Muslims who are living out here. Many of whom I guess are illiterate. Just they're Muslim because, well, the Muslim, they're Muslim born in a Muslim village, they're Muslim. Uh, they would know very little uh, about, if anything, about what we're talking about here. But to Muslims, Christians were the great aggressors. They acted in the name of Christ. You might say to me, well, have Muslims always been gentle and meek and mild? Well, no, they haven't. But they don't pretend to follow the Prince of Peace, do they? And here we have a dark spot, really, in the history of of the Christian church. And it involved, it, it lowered, and this is another uh, result, this, it lowered the whole moral temperature of Christianity. And it gave an excuse for further atrocities to be committed, not against Muslims, but against Christian heretics, persecution and punishment and torture. Here's some quotes about the Crusades. The Holy War was itself nothing more than an act of intolerance in the name of God, which is a sin against the Holy Spirit. Ralph Winter said this. He said it was the most massive misconstrual of Christian mission in all history. Runciman, who in 1954 wrote a book, A History of the Crusades, says this. Seen in the perspective of history the whole crusading movement was a vast fiasco. 
The triumphs of the Crusades were the triumphs of faith, but faith without wisdom is a dangerous thing. The historian, as he gazes back across the centuries at their gallant story, must find his admiration overcast by sorrow at the witness that it bears. There was so much courage and so little honour, so much devotion and so little understanding. If you visit some English churches today, Anglican Church of England, you go in there, even in some little villages, you'll often see the, the crusader, the, the knight in stone lying on his, uh, on his stone tomb with his helmet, even with his sword by his side, sometimes his hands in an act of prayer, sometimes a Bible open. The plan was simply to exterminate the Muslims or to make them their slaves and recapture the land. As unbelievers, the thinking was though they were destined for hell anyway. You see, this was a period of church history of which I think we should not only be ashamed, but which we should declare must never, ever happen again. And it's a difficult matter to deal with if Muslims do raise it in your course of conversation. Well, finally... Was any voice raised against the Crusades? We're talking of, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of Christians. Did anybody raise any voice against it? Well, there were two lone voices, really, uh, one of whom is most surprising. One of the lone voices raised against this whole idea of Crusades was Francis of Assisi. You remember Francis of Assisi? He was supposed to have, according to legend, the stigmata, in other words, the the, 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 the prince of the nails in his hands and his feet. He was the one who called his, the animals his brothers and sisters. Um, he said this, Muslims should be won by love and not by hate. He didn't just say that. He was, a, he was an incredible character. He founded what became the Franciscan order of monks. They had three rules, poverty, chastity and obedience. And obedience being the rule of evangelism. We obey the call to go and share the gospel. In 1210, there were 11 Franciscans. By 1219, that's nine years later, there were 5,000 Franciscans trying to bring back the simplicity and the joy of Christianity and also a service to the poor. Well, he tried three times to evangelise the Muslims. He tried and failed in Morocco in 1212. He then went to Spain in 1214. Thirdly, his third attempt was, he went out with the fifth crusade, the final one, and he actually camped with them in Egypt and asked to see the Sultan of Egypt. Incredibly, and I think probably because he was a holy man and holy men were highly regarded, he managed to get right into the presence of the Sultan of Egypt. I mean, the mind boggles. There's this little, uh, uh, I guess, Italian uh, holy man, complete language barrier, really, seeking to explain the gospel to the Egyptian leader. And he seemed to have had a, a good hearing, despite the atrocities that were being committed just outside of the, of the palace. Um, he was listened to. And I see in this man an example, a forerunner, in some degree, of how we should act when it comes to taking the gospel to Muslims. He led the way in in demonstrating Muslims could be potential brothers and sisters in Christ. And actually, by the end of the 13th century, Franciscus had gone to the ends of the earth. Uh, And two small points that come from this. Uh, The Crusades did did do one good thing. In the Middle Ages, it made people realise there was a heathen world beyond theirs. They began to hear something about other nations and other peoples and goings on beyond. And also, this leader, St. Francis, was really bringing in a whole new spirit of mission into the Christian world. The only other person who did anything uh, serious in this area was a man called Raymond Lull. Raymond Lull was born into a very rich Roman Catholic family in Mallorca, He served at the king of Aragon's court in Spain. His own words were, I lived a life of utter immorality. I had a wife, I had children, and I had many mistresses as well. He was a very intellectual, very creative, 
man and one day he was actually writing uh, a pornographic song, if you can imagine that. He was composing it. And as he was writing it, suddenly he, had a, he saw Christ hanging on the cross looking at him as he was writing this song. So he obviously couldn't carry on writing the song. Uh, next week, same thing happened again. He was writing this uh, erotic lyric and at that moment he had another vision of Christ and it was then that he committed his life to Christ and the great uh, missionary Samuel Zwamer says he was born again but with some doubts his doubts being I quote how can I defiled with impurity rise and enter on a holier life well he forsook his wealth his prestige and characteristic of his age, he joined the Franciscans, who by then were, were, had really grown rapidly. He fasted, he meditated, he prayed, and excluded himself from the world. And he had another vision. And in this vision, he, he tells that a pilgrim came and challenged him to go into the world with the message of Christ. And so he dedicated himself to foreign missions and to the hated and feared enemy, the Muslim. I haven't got time to go into all his story, but he had some great battles in the process of getting out there. One was learning the language. He felt he needed to learn the language. And he set a benchmark there, realising if you're going to communicate the gospel, you've got to learn the language of the people that you're going to. And so he employed a slave, uh, a, a sort of Muslim slave, to teach him Arabic. But unfortunately, while he was learning Arabic, he was also seeking to evangelise this slave. This slave got so fed up with him constantly as he felt thrusting the gospel down his throat that the slave turned to him and cursed Christ in front of him. He then completely lost it, lost his temper and hit the slave. The slave then turned around with a bit of wood and hit him, seriously injuring him. He went to hospital and the slave went to prison. And fearing the worst, the slave then committed suicide. Not the best start to a language learning process of a missionary, is it? And it, it was close to him abandoning the whole thing. But he didn't. He went forward and actually ended up at the age of 80 in uh, what is today Algeria as a martyr. His methods were interesting, very blunt witness. He would stand up. He'd go through the Ten Commandments and show how Muhammad had broken each of the Ten Commandments. Not quite the way to uh, win friends and influence people. Um, very direct. Uh, he was imprisoned and finally uh, he was stoned to death. Nonetheless, we have to say that he gave us three important ingredients. Number one, you need to know the language. I think we're all going to struggle a little bit in this port, aren't we, with being unable to communicate. Secondly, you need to know what Muslims believe and be able to present it in a way that they understand. And thirdly, you need to be a faithful and bold witness, even if it means at the cost of life itself. Finally, he said, missionaries will convert the world by preaching, but also through the shedding of tears and blood and with great labour, and maybe through a bitter death. Raymond Lull. Next week we'll look at the beliefs and practices. Let's just pray for today. Lord, as we look back at this very mixed history, we see so many mistakes. And yet, in it we also see those who began to understand the Christian mission and the way that should be conducted Lord, help us to learn from the mistakes. Help us to have a love, a burden for these people that they might come to know freedom from sin and joy in Jesus. And may you use us this day towards that end. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.